Hello everyone, Dr. Polaris here, and welcome to this 200th episode special focusing on how terrestrial animals bounced back in the first 1 million years after the extinction of the non-avian dinosaurs. The KPG extinction event had a profound impact on the overall trajectory of life on this planet. Due to the truly horrific environmental conditions brought about by the Chicxulub asteroid impact, including global wildfires, acid rain, mega tsunamis, and an extended period of cold and darkness that probably lasted for several years. Roughly 75% of all Maastrichtian species died out. All life was affected by the catastrophe. Not only animals, but plants as well. With Cretaceous floral communities undergoing heavy losses comparable to the herbivores that fed on them, all fully terrestrial animals larger than a cat became extinct, with those possessing specialised lifestyles being more vulnerable, which mostly explains the demise of the non-avian dinosaurs. As the planet's dominant megafaunal creatures, there was simply nowhere for them to hide during the initial impact, while in its aftermath, the great reptiles that did survive would have starved to death due to a lack of resources. Indeed, devoted plant eaters of all kinds were hit very hard by the KPG extinction event, from huge browsing ornithischians, such as Edmontosaurus and Triceratops, to the much smaller fully herbivorous lizards and mammals. In a similar vein, specialised land-based carnivores were also in the firing line, given the loss of their preferred prey. This not only led to the demise of carnivorous non-avian dinosaurs, but many other groups as well, including several lineages of meat-eating metatherian mammals, such as the deltatheroids and the stagodontids with their derived crushing molars. In the oceans, all mosasaurs and plesiosaurs vanished at the Cretaceous-Paleocene boundary, while open water predatory bony fish were hit very hard, with entire lineages dying out, including the diverse pachycormids, while some groups, such as the carnivorous enchodontoids, seem to have survived the impact only to perish during the Paleocene. Some of the more specialised Lake Cretaceous sharks died out as well, including the bizarre manta ray-like eagle shark Aquila lamna, which likely became extinct following a decline in plankton populations, brought about by ocean acidification. Important animals that sat at the base of food webs, such as the reef-building rudists and the floating ammonites, vanished for similar reasons. On land, squamates, mammals and certain groups of avian dinosaurs survived, although all of these certainly didn't pass through the event unscathed, and in many cases suffered notable casualties. Among the squamates, many of the archaic snake relatives died out, as did the interestingly derived polyglyphanodontian lizards and the large oceanic mosasaurs. Sphenodontian relatives of the Tuatara survived, although they did not persist for long in Paleogene South America. In addition, many basal mammal lineages either died out or saw their diversity cut. On the northern continents, metatherians were hit very hard, and although they persisted at low levels of diversity into the Miocene in Eurasia, never truly recovered from the KPG extinction event. Why this was the case is not well understood. Perhaps this was due to the largely arboreal or specialised carnivorous niches held by these animals. On the other hand, they truly thrived on the southern continents during the Paleocene and Eocene. The superficially rodent-like multituberculates survived in greater numbers, perhaps due to their ability to burrow and feed on a wide variety of foodstuffs. On the southern continent, their potential herbivorous relatives, the Gondwanotheres, also passed into the Cenozoic, especially in South America. In fact, the multituberculates in particular underwent a notable diversification event during the early Paleocene, which seems to have suppressed the initial diversification of the placental mammals, although we'll cover this in more detail a bit later. Meanwhile, eutherian mammals appear to have withstood the extinction event relatively well, although some of the more specialised lineages did die out at the boundary, including the herbivorous and seemingly widespread Zolestids, as well as the hopping Zolamdolestids. The largely insectivorous Kimolestans were among the survivors, and underwent a moderate diversification event in the Paleocene and Eocene. Members of Leptictida, which originated during the late Cretaceous as small shrew-like insectivores, survived and expanded in size and ecological diversity, filling niches similar to those of modern Sengis, Bandicoots and Bilbies in the tropical forests of Eurasia and North America. Leptictidans appear to have been close relatives of placentals, 
who were famously one of the major beneficiaries of the KPG extinction event, diversifying explosively during the Paleocene. The origins of these successful mammals remain shrouded in mystery, with phylogenetic studies indicating that the basal ancestors of modern Xenarthrans, Aphrothyrs, Euarchontoglias, and Laurasiotherians diverged during the late Cretaceous. Although as yet no convincing fossil evidence of this has been found, Therefore, the question of placental origins has been a very contentious one among paleontologists, with some scientists suggesting that the phylogenetic studies are misleading, and that we should only focus on direct fossil evidence. Although I personally think this interpretation is a bit misguided, as there are a ton of other, even longer gaps in the fossil record, for groups such as Spinosaurs, Oviraptorosaurs, and Therizinosaurs, for example. The same issues were previously raised concerning the origins of Neornithene birds, another lineage of animals that diversified rapidly during the Paleocene. Phylogenetic studies had long indicated that the three major groups of Neornithines, the Paleonaths, Galloanserans, and Neoaves, had all diverged during the Cretaceous, although fossil evidence was lacking. However, the discovery of the Maastrichtian Asterionis, a definitive basal member of Galloanserae, the chicken and duck-like birds, proved that all three modern bird groups had their origins in the late Cretaceous. These animals probably survived due to their overall small size and cryptic terrestrial or semi-aquatic habits, being able to feed on a mixture of insects, seeds and water plants. More archaic members of Aviolae, such as the highly diverse Enantionothenes and the flightless marine Hesperornithes, were victims of their own success. With their preferred environments, being forests and coastal regions respectively, were ravished by the KBG extinction event. A preference for freshwater ecosystems also allowed crocodilians and their relatives to persist into the Cenozoic. In addition to their relatively slow metabolisms, being capable of going for months without eating, in addition to their ability to dig burrows in the side of riverbanks, recent studies have found that inland freshwater rivers and lakes were the environment type least affected by the bolide impact which also allowed the mysterious reptilian Tristoderans, soft-shelled turtles and amphibians to survive. So, with this broad brush background information out of the way, let's now turn to examine a particular ecosystem dated to less than a million years after the impact during the earliest Paleocene. Our best candidate for this is the Denver Formation, unsurprisingly located close to Denver, Colorado. This formation spans the latest Cretaceous and Paleocene, giving a very valuable insight into how faunal communities reacted to the KPG extinction event. With the non-avian dinosaurs out of the way, mammals found space to diversify, although the vast majority of mammals that survived the extinction event were no bigger than rats. Within the first one million years after the impact, the survivors rapidly developed larger body sizes and moved into new niches, especially herbivorous ones. There are no rodents or lagomorphs present here, as these animals almost certainly evolved in Asia and later migrated into North America. Although the archaic gnawing multituberculates were still around, the most notable of these was Taniolabis, the most massive multituberculate to ever live. About the size of a modern beaver and weighing up to 33 kilograms or 75 pounds, this animal would have vaguely resembled a large marmot with a relatively long tail, a square blocky skull and highly derived chewing teeth. It would have lived a relatively slow, unhurried lifestyle on the subtropical forest floor, feeding on tough, low-growing vegetation. Other multituberculates were present in the formation as well, but these were generally much smaller, with some genera having survived the KPG extinction event, such as Mesodma and Chimexomus, which ranged from mouse to small rat-sized, and would have generally filled a similar niche to modern rodents. Similarly, although their remains have not yet been found at the Denver Formation, the first tiny relatives of primates were scampering about in the trees, with the potential proto-primate Purgatorius first appearing just 100,000 years after the impact in North America. However, the vast majority of the mammals found at the Denver Formation belong to the so-called placental condyloths, putative relatives of modern hoofed herbivorous mammals. These included the very controversial genus Protongulatum, which has frequently been regarded as a very basal relative of modern ungulates. It was also once thought to have dwelt in the Maastrichtian at Hell Creek, although this is generally no longer considered valid. Although several studies published in the 2010s considered this animal to have been a non-placental eutherian, 
Most recent studies have at least tentatively supported the basal ungulate classification, due largely to analysis of its inner ear structure. Another fairly important group, probable early ungulate relatives, make their first appearance in this formation. These were the Arctocyonids. A possible wastebasket family, traditionally classified as basal relatives of artiodactyls, although none of them looked anything like modern hoofed mammals on the surface. These were represented here by the raccoon-sized genus Bioconodon, which lived just 100,000 years after the extinction event. Like all supposed Arctocyonids, it possessed a very generalised build and dentition, suggesting a broad omnivorous diet and the ability both to dig and climb in trees. It was quite similar to its slightly later relative Loxolophus, which would have somewhat resembled a living coati, with five-toed plantigrade feet, a pointed snout and a long counterbalancing tail. Like many mammals from the Denver Formation, it would have had an unspecialised diet, feeding on insects, fruit, soft plant material and small vertebrates. Other basal ungulates included the numerous peritychids, which were among the oldest of all placental mammals, and diversified quickly during the early Paleocene. The recently described genus Militocodon lived about 610,000 years after the asteroid impact, and was a small and probably quite cute little animal about the size of a rat, weighing between 273 and 455 grams. It would have probably been a generalist herbivore or omnivore that lived on the forest floor. Other peritychids were significantly larger, being among the first Paleocene mammals to develop larger body sizes, alongside the multituberculate Tania labis. These included the type genus Peritychus itself, which was more well adapted to a diet of tough vegetation, combining fairly specialised chewing molars with a fairly generalised body plan. It was probably not a very fast runner, but would have been a capable climber and digger, living like a more herbivorous raccoon or small bear, weighing up to 23 kilograms. The genus Ectoconus was larger still, being about the size of a sheep, and would have resembled a long-tailed bear more than any living ungulate. When it plodded through the subtropical forests of Colorado, roughly 300,000 years after the asteroid impact, it was among the largest land mammals on Earth at the time. Like other so-called archaic placental mammals, it possessed a small and fairly simple brain for its body size. Notable in their absence were highly specialised large carnivorous mammals to hunt these growing herbivores, although the first inkling of what was later to come were the first Mesonychians. Famous for being so-called wolves on hooves, these carnivorous basal ungulates first appear in the early Paleocene in the form of the Trisodontids. These animals were comparative giants for the time in which they lived, with the genus Eoconodon being about the size of a wolf, weighing about 40 kilograms and with remains datable to roughly 700,000 years after the impact. It possessed a robust skull and a powerful set of jaws and teeth, although these were less specialised for hypercarnivory than later Mesonychians, with Eoconodon probably being an opportunistic omnivore, much like modern grizzly bears, feeding on plants, carrion and sometimes ambushing smaller herbivores. And it wasn't just mammals that were commonplace at the Denver Formation. The crocodile-like Yusukian Borealisuchus was incredibly common, comprising over half of all fossil remains at some sites. Several species are known, with the one present at the Denver Formation being B. sternbergii. This roughly 2-3 metre long carnivore was another survivor of the KPG extinction event, having first appeared roughly 70 million years ago and diversified during the Paleocene. Despite looking very much like living crocodilians, this genus has generally been found to be a more basal animal outside the clade crocodilia. It would have been by far the largest predator in this environment, likely ambushing all of the aforementioned mammals at the water's edge if it had the chance. So, even with the non-avian dinosaurs gone, and mammals in the ascendant, this was still a very strange time to our eyes, with most of these furry animals looking nothing at all like their closest living relatives. This was a world where hoofed mammal relatives resembled bears, raccoons or coates, and were only beginning to experiment with more dedicated herbivory and carnivory, showcasing the adaptiveness which made them the most diverse early placental mammals. Meanwhile, in early Paleocene North America, multituberculates filled the niches taken today by rodents, and were relatively diverse themselves until the Middle Paleocene, when the group began to decline. It was once thought that this was due to being outcompeted by rodents and ungulates, but this is no longer thought to be the case. 
Instead, the group is thought to have responded poorly to a changing climate and the rise of new mammalian predators such as the Miakids. However, the group as a whole held on until the end of the Eocene, with the last known forms being generalists. For the remainder of the Paleocene, potential mammals stayed fairly unspecialised and comparatively small, with the largest herbivorous forms being no bigger than cows, and even this was something of a rarity. We would have to wait until the Eocene before more recognisable crown group placentals would appear, such as the first bats, carnivorans, whales, and hoofed ungulates. Thanks for watching, everyone. I'd like to give a big thank you to all the people that have supported this channel over the years and have really helped it to grow, particularly my patrons on Patreon, who always come up with some really great ideas for videos. This may be the 200th Dr. Polaris episode, but really, this is just the beginning. I've got a whole bunch more content planned for the future. The next episode will be covering the Aurochs, the wild ancestor of the domesticated taurine cattle. See you again soon. Cheerio.